This is Hannibal here from TheHannibalTV.com, and I'm with WWE Hall of Famer, three-time NWA Tag Team Champion. He's the reigning NWA Tag Team Champion. He's, he wrestles for New Japan. He's wrestled for pretty much every major promo promotion. Ricky Morton from the Rock and Roll Express. How are you doing today, sir? Hannibal, I'm doing great. We're uh, Robert and I are nine-time World Tag Team Champions for NWA. Uh, we were a lot of times, you know, when Jimmy Crockett, when, when NWA shut down years ago, went to WCW, Jimmy Crockett took it to Dallas, Texas. Uh, a lot of them wasn't, I guess, recorded then, but as to us, we stick with the nine time. So thank you very much, Hannibal. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I'll keep that one for the future. I think one day I'll have to do an in-person interview with you where we'll go through your career piece yeah, by food, piece man. but today i'm just going to be kind of all over the place uh, a lot uh of well food. understand me on my answering when i when i do answer it but yeah, yeah i'm like a rubber ball i bounce around like a son of a bitch okay all right well to jump into it uh a lot of i'm gonna be asking mostly fan questions and uh joe wanted okay. to hear about your feud with rick flair and is it true that you once turned down the chance of being NWA world champion. Yeah, man, cool. Uh, you know what? Uh, uh, at that time, I, I felt like I was one of the luckiest guys in the world to be able. And and the way this got started, that was when they was grooming Magnum TA to be the, to work in Ego with Flair, I guess, to put, you know, for them to have the, the feud over the belt. But then Magnum had a car wreck and, paralyzed him broke his neck and then i was uh i was there robert was hurt for a little while and i was doing some single matches and, and flair seen me but you know he flair knew me anyway i worked with flair many times and just something clicked uh right along with that uh, to have the opportunity and, and to me i tell you to, to me rick flair is the greatest he was the greatest in WA world heavyweight champion. Matter of fact, I think he's the, the best in the, in the I, it, excuse me, easy for you to say, but I think he was the best heavyweight champion, one of the best workers ever in this business. And the reason why is when Rick stepped in the ring, I don't care where he was at, what kind of mood he was in, or how he always gave the fans some money's worth. Uh, when I first started my angle with Flair, uh, you know, we was on bicycle tapes, and I don't know if the fans understand what a bicycle tape is. That's uh, when it shows one town at a week all, all over the territory. And, and sometimes you're three weeks behind on the tape. So uh, by the time the people see this, when Flair and I arrived at the town, you know, we started it off with 17 days straight in a row, hour time limit matches. And, uh, and if you were one of the boys in the business, you call it Broadway. Uh, that was twice on Saturday and twice on Sunday, not including wrestling on TBS early in the morning because we filmed that. You come on at six oh five, but we filmed it like seven o'clock in the morning every Saturday morning. But the greatest opportunity to work with Rick and uh, there knows things. Rick and I broke attendant records all over the place. And it's, you know what, and that's what our business is about. It's about ratings and about putting asses in seats. And that's something that uh, Rick and I did because, you know, the business was different then. It was sacred. Uh, nobody knew what the finishes were going to be a week ahead of time of the matches. Uh, we believed in kayfabe. And yes, I had the opportunity, but first of all, you have to understand the politics in the wrestling business. Uh, Robert and I were having great runs with the Midnight Express, the Four Horsemen, uh, all of them. But, uh, but you got to understand, dude, when you, when you're over like that, the office. You know, they couldn't grab that hold on you, grab me by the nuts and squeeze them. I wouldn't let them. Uh, they wanted to, you know, they come to me. 
and uh, I beat Flair. We, you know, I beat him in Richmond, Virginia, for the world heavyweight title. Uh, but they brought me to back and uh, told me they had to break me and Robert up of the Rock and Roll Express and uh, to make it blunt and give it, uh, I handed it back to them and told them I didn't want it. Uh, that, you know, Robert and I started the Rock and Roll Express student. See, we wasn't known for just coming into territories. Robert and I, dude, we, we went into territories when they were rock bottom and we blew the roofs off of we what you call we call it popping territories. Yeah. And that that's what that's what Robert and I did. And and don't get me wrong, a lot of people claim that they were the best, but they'd come in when the territory was hot. Uh Robert and I would go into the territories when they were drawing a hundred people. Uh and that's just the way it was. That's what it's what got us over, and that's what got it. But, you know, they couldn't control me. I wouldn't let them control me. because, And that's what's wrong with me. What happened to me in the business today, dude? I screwed up for the boys. Might have been wrong. It might have hurt me in the long run, which it did hurt me in the long run. But uh, I always and I stood up for the boys, and I always did. Now, for Ric Flair, I guess because you were usually facing against each other, you weren't partying with them too much? Uh, well, we can't fade back then. Uh, but don't get me wrong, dude. We still, uh, dude, we were on the road every night. You know, and only thing bad about the old man is because you didn't have the uh, all the people in the office and everybody that was working for him. Hell, what not? We'd be in Miami next night. You'd be in Los Angeles. Uh, you know, next night Portland, Oregon, then back to New York City. Uh, you know, nowadays they have people in the office that work a certain. You know, when you're town by town by town. They go around. Uh, it was something new. We just started something new with nationwide on TV. Dude, I had a lot of good times with Flair. <laughs> I don't, I don't think I didn't. You know, and man, I was. You got to understand this, and, and I'm serious. They were showing, uh, you know, Robert and I did these videos out of Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, that we, you know, we played second fiddle to the fabulous ones. Then, uh, you know, they were some promoters tag team he didn't want us over them so robert and i went out on our own buddy when we did you know, we you know we pop territories with these videos we did like mtv's for the first time people seen this uh in the territories and and it's the first time they've seen young baby faces uh you know you got to understand uh most of the territories were owned by baby faces and they were, you know, 300 pounds, six, seven. We, uh, you know, we, we went into the territory, man. We were the young baby faces. And wow. We were rock stars. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to say. I've been with Ric Flair and, and, uh, Hard Rock Cafe, New York city, Chuck Berry on the stage, sitting there. I said, Rick, we was with two checks, and he uh, he paid two thousand five hundred dollars a chair for us to sit up front to watch Chuck Berry in the Hard Rock Cafe. But he bought them from the people that was sitting there. So as oh, soon okay. as we walked in, Chuck Berry recognized us and put us on stage with him. And then I turned around, and Dan Aykroyd was sitting right beside me too, uh, uh, watching Chuck. But that's how over. The right we were off, off at TV, man. It's all around the world. Had some great times partying with Ric Flair, dude. And you mentioned uh, Memphis. You had a little angle with Macho Man there, where he pal drove you through a table. Any memories of working with Savage in those days? Oh God, I worked with Savage in other territories for Nick Gillis. Uh, You know, they had their own little territory at Cape Girardeau, Missouri. I uh, used to go up and work for him up and there. But you but you would see out of Memphis, uh, like I was saying, Robert and I, we played second fiddle. You know, the Fabulous Ones was up there with them. And, you know, and we're underneath. And the sav and the angle that we were with Savage, you know, it just happened. Uh, Robert and I were working him in Lanny in Memphis. And, uh, we got on the table. We was the first ones to ever break a table, and it was by accident. Uh, 
when Randy power dropped me through the table, the table broke. And if you notice, instead of me getting back up, going into the finish, I stayed on the floor selling it. And see, that's what got that over. If, uh, a lot of guys, you know, we made our own angle happen by accident. And uh, we went around the territory and got over you. But I was, uh, you know, Randy was a great worker, too. He was, uh, his charisma, too. I mean, he stand out. But, he, uh, you know, Randy had a lot of balls on him, too. He, uh, he'd take chances. But it was great. I, uh, I knew Randy for years. You know, he worked for Nick Goulas, too. And uh, he was uh, Lanny and, and him and his dad, Angelo Poffo. He did the profit gimmick. But, you know, this so happened when they broke the table and I sold it, it went right into its own angle. So, uh, and we did good business with that. Were you ever concerned at all working a bet with him because he had a little bit of heat at the time because he went from working for the, uh, with Randy Savage because of the heat that he had at that time uh, with Jerry Lawler? No, but you had to, you know, you see, uh, and, and what, and one thing that I like for everybody to understand that the boys, now I told you earlier where, where I stood up for the boys. See, the boys were the boys. Uh, I, you know, I didn't worry about I me. Mean, I don't know. See, because even though he had heat with Lawler, he was working the territory, so they must have worked something out. Uh, but I like Randy. I mean, we were the boys. You know, we depended. You know, we didn't have uh, these guaranteed checks you got every week on contracts. I never had one, uh, matter of fact. Uh, you got paid by how many asses you put in the seats. And uh, and we had, you know, when it's especially when you're having a good run and you and you made the, the angle yourself work. I did you know, it, we we were making a little money. So uh, whatever went on with him at Lawler, but that was their problem. I didn't, you know, that didn't concern me. I didn't stick my nose in other people's businesses. Right. Uh, uh, like that, and uh, and to be on the road. See, we worked every night together, guys, and uh, you don't have time for sh for shit like that. To me, I don't. You know, I, I I didn't. I didn't. You know, it's even right now, even having heat with the boys. I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I never hated no one. I mean, I did a lot of things to try to make some money, different wise, and I stood up for the boys. But then when the boy, but when those boys got in charge, they didn't understand what the business was about. And they only took care of a few or only their self. Now, I just liked them for doing that, but I don't hate them. How they smarter than I was, they got millions and millions. I don't. Okay. <laughs> and how did you get along with Jerry Jarrett? Well I, well, I started there. You know, I started for a little promoter named Nick Kudlis, uh out of uh, out of Nashville, Tennessee. And then my dad, my dad was a referee for Jerry Jarrett. You know, and I've been in the business all my life. I knew how, uh, but when I went to work for him, but, you know, but but understand when when you go into a territory, I try to tell guys. I, I don't know. Did you work Hannibal? Yes. Okay. For a while, you, yeah. yeah. I mean, did you work territories or did you work for big companies? Uh, basically Puerto Rico, England, basically. Okay, yeah. yeah, we'll see. And and now you understand. I mean, if you work for Carlos in Puerto Rico, you, you weren't going to get over Carlos. <laughs> you, you, you understand what I'm saying? Especially yeah. if you're a baby face. Uh, in Memphis, you know, Jerry Jarrett was a booker. He, he wasn't rest at the time, but Jerry Lawler and Bill Dundee. With the two top baby faces. Uh, I see a lot of people coming in and trying to buck them. And, you know, and they didn't last the territory too long. And this is what I, and the reason I asked you that earlier, I'm bouncing, dude. That's funny. It's because people, I wish the territories had come back. But see, the territory is not good for the boys. It's only good for the owner. Take, for instance, and, and I, and I tell you this right here, this so happened. We, 
And our business has been at the right place at the right time. But you asked me about Jerry Jarrett. I got along great with Jerry Jarrett. I just wasn't his boys. You understand me? Yes. He, he invented the fabulous ones. They were the tag team. Jerry Lawler invented Robert and I. But we were second fiddle to the fabulous ones. You hear me? And the yeah. reason why, because they were going to go opposition. And maybe later on this interview, we get into that. But we weren't going to get over the fabulous ones no matter what. But this, but to tell you about territories, <laughs> we Bill Watts run Mid-South, and he was the top baby face. And he didn't like small workers because he was a big guy. You was a small hill. You didn't work there. I mean, you, you didn't. You had to be big. And for instance, when we went in to Louisiana, I think Abdullah the Butcher, if I recall, he was the top baby face. And the reason he was the top baby face is because Bill Watts was the top baby face and he just had his blow off with Abdullah. Where Abdullah was the top heel and he beat Abdullah. So their angle's over. Now they got to get a new heel to come in. So the new heel comes in and he beats everybody in the territory. Then he shoots an angle with Abdullah. Because Abdullah's the top baby face, and then that heel beats Abdullah, then Bill Watts wrestles the top heel. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. That's the way territories worked. Uh, if you were a good heel, you'd go into the territory and you'd have a good run, uh, make money with the top baby face that owned the territory <laughs> or the top or the booker that hit, that pushed himself as the top baby face. And uh, you know what I'm talking about when you when you see stuff like that, right there. But uh, as getting along with with uh, Jerry, man, you know Memphis territory was the greatest place in the world to run the business. You had some of the greatest workers in the business that come through there, and it, that really started there. Uh, at that time, uh, you worked every night. You know, you had shows, you know, spot shows and house shows. You know. Especially Memphis, you know, Memphis is every Monday night, Louisville, Kentucky, every Tuesday, Evansville, Indiana, it was either territory. Then your spot shows, uh, live TV, you know, Nashville, Jonesboro, every Saturday night. So when you was in the territory, you worked every night and you learned this business. And I, and, and I watched, even when I went to NWA and met Dusty, dude, I watched everything these guys did everything how to draw money what puts asses in seats and what don't put asses in seats so as for me getting along with uh jerry jared i got along with him great still do uh i learned a lot from him you know and sometimes it's hard to believe and see at jerry jared in his day he was a he was a don't get me wrong he was one of the top workers in the world but he was a baby face and if guys would understand this, <coughs> excuse me, be it a baby face, what gets you over is selling. And I learned that from Jerry Jarrett uh, about selling. Selling's what gets you over. You know, uh, you watch, even watch the independence of some of the CDS stuff you ever see in your life. But a lot, everybody can leapfrog, drop down, and drop kick. And do a moonsault because you see a thousand of them every show. Uh, but it's only a few that know how to work. And that's that's the part of our business that's, that's lost now. But it's still there. You know, I have people ask me all the time about, do you think wrestling will ever come back? You know, wrestling's never dead. Wrestling's entertainment. Now everybody knows it's entertainment. But when they learn how to to go back to the old days and, and keep the entry. See, nowadays, me, especially me being in business, when I, when I watch TV, I can tell you what they're going to do. And I'm not even really follow the match. I know what's going to happen on the finish. I know where it's leading to. I know where it's going. But when you guys, great baby faces, learn how to tell those stories uh, to keep the people going. And But to answer your question, I got a long way. Great with uh, Jerry Jarrett. And for Mid South, where you were just talking about, how did you find the travel? Because I heard that was pretty brutal travel. Yeah, you know, every territory was brutal back then. Uh, 
you know, it was just a long, only thing wrong about them in South there, you only had one interstate and it went, uh, East and West. That was interstate 10. Now it's not like that, but, uh, you had long trips. I mean, your trips were 350 miles, but most of them were just two lane highways. Uh, and then, uh, every other weekend you flew to, uh, Oklahoma city. You did a double shot then on that Sunday. It was at Oklahoma and Af- Oklahoma city afternoon in Tulsa that night, but you, but you flew that show. Uh, but the other ones, yeah, I mean, they were, it wasn't a part about them being really, really long. It was a part that was no interstates and two lane highways, you know, going through your big towns like Alex, Alexander Shreveport, uh, Monroe, Louisiana, that there was no interstates going to them. all two lane. You go through a hundred, hundred little towns, man. Jeez. <laughs> it's a, you know, but, uh, the travel, it was, it was hard, but the territory was great. Uh, I had a lot of fun there, you know, young in the business and, and, uh, get the push that Bill Watts gave us. Uh, man, we, uh, it was something different at that time, you know, and, and, and Bill finally learned too, uh, you know, Bill, Bill Watts, he, uh, you know, if you read his book, you know, he had his territory for 10 years. And the two years that Robert and I, he made he made more money in those two years than he did put together in the eight years that he run the territory. So you got along well with him, I imagine. Well, I was this candy kid, uh, <laughs> but what that? I, I you know I I treat people the way they treat me, and, and understand me. If you own a business, you know if you have a job that you work eight hours a day and uh, it's from seven to three or seven to four. Okay. They expect you to be there at seven and time clock. See, that's all. It's the only things that Bill Watts asked you. And let me tell you, he asked you to be there an hour before the show. Uh, and then after a while, especially when we did our angles with the midnight express, we had riots every night. And then he made, Nobody could lead the building to the shows were over because, you know, the marks hitting the ring and golly, I watched Jimmy Cornette get his ass whooped. You know, really, I, I watched him learn how to fight because he got his ass whooped so many times he got tired of it. But, uh, but you know, that was the whole thing of the territory. I got along with the guys great. Uh, and I still do, you know, Bill, you know, but, but like I say in Bill, you know, at any job, you know, you got to clock in at seven, so don't be late. If you get late, you get docked, and that's the same thing that Bill Watts did. And Bill Watts, Robert and I were the only two that could wear blue jeans, but they had to have a crease in them because he made you dress the part of who you were. Uh, so, I mean, he didn't ask that much from me, so he wasn't that really hard-ass. He just, he ran a mall, he ran a, a business. And uh, when you're the boss man, you can run your business any way you want to. Were you working for Mid South when uh, Sting had his incident with Dick Slater there? Uh, yes, I was. <laughs> I went. I just came in. Uh, me and Flair were. Uh, you know, I, I'd been there, but as you know, what I was having my room with Flair, and and the Bill Watts territory was still open. Uh, I know that. I, do, I really don't know what happened because it was all because Mid Flair were in the back in the bathroom, and uh, Steen come in to put his makeup on. Then here come, here comes Slater in, and you know, it was bop, 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 and that was all. And I and, and I'm getting back to the point. I didn't. I'm one of the boys. That was none of my business. I didn't know what was happening. I. Uh, now, Dick Slater was a tough son of a bitch. <laughs> you hear me? Uh, not to be a shooter or that. He was just a tough ass. Right. Now, you mentioned uh, riot situations. You were a baby face but most of your career. But what was the scariest riot situation you've been involved with? Got up. Dude, I, I remember one time, Nikola Bokov, you know, they had the gimmick we put the the rope around my neck and threw me over the top rope and I'm hanging, but I wasn't scared for myself. I was scared for them. Cause I seen a guy come 
running with a knife and uh and I screamed at Nikolai Bokoff and the guy went right down with the knife. I'm gonna tell you how precise this cut was. It hit the side of his boot and went all the way down past the ankle. And when Nikolai stepped out, he stepped out of his boot. But I seen a lot of them like that. I seen uh, I seen Dennis Condridge a guy hit the ring with a knife uh, and cut Dennis. Uh, guys, uh, you know it. It was a different time and different place, and every night was like that. Uh, not only fearing for ourselves, but the crowd, because man, people would throw. You know, you were at Puerto Rico. <laughs> Gosh, man, uh, I don't know. The time I was there, man, I. I remember Robert and I were wrestling Bobby Jagger's daddy Crawford uh, in a match. And I'm looking for the referee. And I couldn't. And I look, he's outside the ring. Somebody hit him in the head with a brick and he was doing convulsions. I, you know, it's, and then it's the part about the fans because people throw stuff, you know, they throw batteries. Uh, you know, Jimmy Cornell had more heat due to the eye of the stove. Gosh, some money, you know, people hated him. Uh, Many times on the finishes, I, you know, especially using the tennis racket, you know, I'd, I'd take the bump and open that one eye. <laughs> I had to watch them fight, <laughs> fight their ass off. Baton Rouge one night, I, and, and we were lucky. Uh, for just some reason, I told Robert, we had a hell of a crowd too, and, uh, and we was the last. And it's when you're on last, when they let the, crowd out I says as soon as the match is over let's meet you or my car is parked outside the door of the dressing room let's run and get in our car and sleep our stuff on and, and go home because we was on the road all the time it's like an hour and a half from Baton Rouge back to Alexandria where we lived at that way you get there quick you know get home spend a few more hours with it but we had <laughs> but we had a right God Almighty, and uh, they was everywhere, but boom, but boom, I rode out of the ring, and me and Robert just shot out the back, out the back door, but but the police come in and arrested everybody, even Ernie Land, <laughs> they, arrested, <laughs> they arrested everybody for inciting a riot, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, yeah. but Robert and I's ass was out of there, uh, I mean, it was like that a lot of times, man, you, you, uh, and, and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that Jimmy Cordette was a tough guy, but, I mean, I've watched him. You know, I guess when you get your ass whooped so many times, you, you're going to fight back. Yeah. So, uh, and that's, that happened there. There was a bunch of fans that wanted me to ask you uh, what you think of Jim Cornette these days. And I know you have a good relationship with AEW, some of his opinions that he that he gives. Uh, you know what, dude? Uh you live in Canada? Yeah. Yeah, but here in the United States, a lot of people died for to have the freedom of speech. And, and don't get me wrong, uh, I don't agree with Jimmy Cornette on a lot of things. Uh, but my opinion's like my ass. Everybody's got one. Jimmy can talk. You know, he has the right to say what he wants to say. Sometimes I don't agree with him. Uh but I don't hate him. You understand? I get well. I get along with Cornette. I talked to him last week about something he called me. Uh, but you see, that's that's the part about staring up shit in our business. You know, one time I did a the greatest thing in the world. I was the first one to do it. I, I had a shoot interview on Kevin Nash, but it wasn't a part about me talking about Kevin. I hated him. I knew nobody had done this before. And and you see, it it's always that little bit of doubt. That's what keeps the wrestling fans coming back. That little bit of doubt, and uh, it worked. Uh, beat Kevin. We worked a match off that, and man, we drew one of the biggest independent houses ever. You know, it's like a seventy six thousand dollar gate that me and him did. So, but but to go back to what I'm talking about, Jimmy Cornette. Uh, another thing is Jimmy Cornette get paid, gets paid a lot of money for his podcast to speak his opinions like that. Uh, but it don't bother me, uh, you know. And if it bothers anybody else, it's 
you know, it's, you know, me, I just, it goes through one ear, not the other ear. I, uh, uh, I'm sorry, but, uh, that's the way I feel about that. I, I really don't give a shit what yeah. he says about anybody. I don't really. And, uh, and if anybody takes it to heart and they're mad about it, uh, smarten up. Shit. Who gives a shit? I'm going to guess he's the favorite manager that you worked with over the years. Oh, no, buddy. I mean, I made a lot of money with him. We made, you know, and I tell you this, us in the Midnight Express, dude, we, we made history in this wrestling business, uh, in my opinion. Uh, you know, it, in 1985 and 1986, 87, you know, Robert and I, I think we were the greatest tag team in the world. If you don't believe me, just ask me. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But what I'm trying to say is, man, we drew money. Robert and I didn't go into territories when it was already hot. We went into them and, and, and popped them. Not only uh, did Louisiana, Memphis, but we'd go down. Eddie Graham, you know, he he ran Florida at the time. Robert and I would go in there. God, man, he'd sell out houses. Uh, out to Kansas City, sell out houses. Uh, we wouldn't work in the territory, but we'd go in there. We, we were just over. Uh, and to get back. Hey, what was the question you asked me? I told you I'm if, like a damn uh, ball bouncing around. If uh, Jim Cornette was your favorite. Oh, group. yeah. Now, to get back to, I mean, I, I made a lot of money with him. We, we made history together. Then the Midnight Express versus the Rock and Roll Express. The Expresses versus the Expresses. But God has a lot of great managers. Uh, Sir Oliver Humperdinck. God, I love it. He was great. Uh, Paul Jones. Skandar Akbar. Uh, you know, we made a lot of money with all these guys, with different teams. Uh, I remember in the early days, Don Carson. Now, do you remember Don Carson? Uh, he was uh, one of the, he was a great worker. And he became a manager later on in, in his years. But, you know, Jimmy, uh, with his mouth, he had more heat than any manager I ever seen. God, man, you, uh, you, to explain it to you, I can't. To explain to you the way things worked back then, uh, you, you had to be a part of it. Uh, you had to understand it because everything we did meant something. You know, Dennis Condry and Bobby Eaton. Bobby Eaton, and, you know, Dennis was the leader of the pack. He had the more experience and, and Bobby was, these guys were such great workers and they knew how to get heat and they knew how to keep it. As me working on the independent shows, yeah, but I'm 64 years old and I still work all the time. <laughs> and, uh, but to go on it and, and try to explain to some of these guys, you know, you, you have your independent show and they have a great match and, and the heel will fuck the baby face, but then the heel will get right on the microphone and kill itself off. And I'm trying to tell them, I said, don't do that. And they look at me like I got a turd on my head. Y you know, uh, that's the whole point of being a heel. You got to cheat. You're the baby face out smart you. The heel, you got to cheat to get him down. And at the end of the match, the heel's got to screw you to win the match. But then when you stay out there, you get on a microphone, you kill yourself off. Uh, a lot of guys don't understand that, uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, in our business, it's, it's a knowledge of, of a, a knowing when to go, when to get out of there, and understanding our business. I, I was at a part of time in the business. And kid, you know, with Jimmy Cornette, you, you're talking about him. Yeah, before I knew Jimmy before he'd gotten wrestling business. He started in Memphis. And the same thing, I, I remember when he first, he was a pitcher guy. He took pictures around the ring, sliding back and forth on knee pads. You know, it was the craziest thing in the world. And and I remember Jerry Jarrett told him, he said, Jimmy, if you can get enough heat with the crowd, as you did the boys, he goes, we're going to make a million dollars. And boy, did he ever. He knew how to talk. He knew how to, to, to pinch that nerve. And, and and like me, I knew how to take care of him. You know, when you're wrestling and you go back and watch our matches, unless it was a, a blow off or, you know, I never even got close to Jimmy Cornette because as me being a baby face, if I touch him, it takes the heat off of him. And right. 
You see, guys don't understand shit like that. You know, they always want, you know, they get that pop. I got to get my shit in. Let me get my shit in. And we just, and none of it means nothing. Uh, I, you know, and, and, and the bigger companies I watch today, dude, this is what I do. This is who I am. And then if you're interested, Hannibal, if you get a chance, I, uh, at the School of Morton, it's on uh, Facebook. I have a YouTube show that comes on every Sunday at 5.05. On YouTube, that's Eastern time. And it's just people from my school. And uh, we do real good. And, you know, and I run a wrestling school. But, but you see, before you could teach anybody our business, is you got to make them understand it. If you don't understand our wrestling business, you're, you're never going to get it. I watch some of the stuff in the, in the, the big organizations. This is what I do. This is who I am. I would love to be a part of them, but but listen to me. The boys change, and I have the right to say what I want to say. Is I believe that the other guys they don't want me there because, but you see, I don't want their job. If I get hard by a company, I want Ricky Morton's job. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. I want my job because I know this business. You know, when, when you when I do uh, these shows on independence and we're coming back in two weeks and, and I know how to do the finish, you know, we're, boom, boom. it's even like, you know, Ricky Morton, you've been nine time world tag team champions. Yes. But I didn't want to be a champion. And the reason I didn't want to be a champion is not the point about that, but understanding our business, I can't make money being a champion. The people pay their money. To see me beat the hill, but the hill keeps screwing me every week. You see what I'm saying? And then you you come back next week where a match where he can't screw me like that, but he'll screw me another way. Always, that's how you put asses in seats every week. And, and, and that's what, what, I, what I was good at. And see, and that's still there to a point. You know, I mean, damn. I, I mean, how many hurricane coronas? How many... Uh, moon songs, how many dives out on the floor? Can you watch in one damn show on TV? It happens. Do you have you noticed that? Yeah. I mean, you watch it. I mean, Jesus Christ. I mean, I I'm expecting for him to shoot Hugo out of the fucking cannon the next show. But the bad part about shooting him out of the cannon is he's gonna kick out on two. And that's what really blows my mind a lot. Yeah, but Jimmy Cornette, to get back to your answer, I'm, I'm that ball bouncing around, but Jimmy Cornette's great. Uh, I like it. He's a good manager, but there's a lot more because in our days, everybody could work. Now, Dusty Rhodes, you've said some stuff against him over the years. I don't know how much of that was shoot or just trying to get some heat, but what is your overall opinion of Working with but, Dusty Rhodes these days. Well, don't get me wrong. Uh, I even told Cody this. You know, it wasn't uh, gravy train with Dusty. You know, me and him had a lot of fuck you matches. You hear me? Uh, but that was a part of the business. But, give it, but God, he was a genius. Uh, I learned so much from Dusty. You know, and you see about understanding. Now, I was telling you this, understanding the business and and don't get me wrong, but when you know in our thing is a rock and roll express, most of the angles were done with me. Uh, it's because Dusty would call me down to the office on we did TV on Tuesdays. I'd go down to the office on Mondays by myself, and you see, this is what's wrong, and this is what Dusty did. Dusty would set me down and explain the angle. So don't get me wrong. A lot of guys, you know, when the booker come in, he pushed himself. A lot of times he pushed himself because he knew what kind of ideas he wanted in his mind. But if you look around, how many of the baby faces can do what he really wants and to feel what he really feels? Well, Dusty told me I had that gift. Okay. Uh, I, I, he told me I had that gift and I'd sit down. And I would understand 
when I can make that guy on the front row feel what I'm feeling. Dude, that's, that's when you got him. Dusty seen that in me. I don't, you know, Terry Reynolds with Dustin's daughter, uh, by Terry Reynolds. She come to me one time and she told me, she says, I was talking to my grandpa one time and I asked him that even though that you were the best baby face in the world, she's talking about Dusty, right? Her grandpa, but she asked him and, and who, who the, one of the best workers in the business was and and she told me, she said, Dusty told, so my grandpa told me that Ricky Morton was the best ever in the business. And, you know, and that's a great compliment. But see, had a lot of things, you know, buddy, you're on the road every time and, and you do the, and you're in this business and some things you don't like. Uh, because, you know, I had my opinions too. Uh, sometimes. A little bit of jealousy will get you in this business. You know, even I have felt that. Uh, everybody does. But as getting along with Dusty, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, I hugged his neck and kissed him and told him I loved him. Do you understand when I'm coming from there? Yeah. But but yeah, but no, we, we had our fuck you times. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? But it wasn't nothing like this, I mean, yeah, don't get me wrong. He fired my ass. He fired my, here he goes. How's this go? Well, he fired my ass and he fired Robert Gibson and he fired Michael Hayes and Dr. Death, too. You see what I'm saying? Uh, but that, <laughs> I, uh, overall, Dusty was one of the, Dusty's the greatest mind ever in this business. And I soaked every bit of it up like a sponge. I just hadn't had my chance yet. And when my chance does come, watch out, buddy. All hell is going to break loose. And how did you like working with Tully Blanchard? I love Tully Blanchard. You know, I uh, worked for him when I was a kid earlier in my days. Uh, you know, uh, my dad, when well, I told you he was in a business, and, and, and I'm so he could see, it's like he could see the future. He told me, he said, tag team wrestling's where it's going to be at. And, uh, and I was fortunate, you know, my first tag team partner was Sonny King. Uh, God, he was great. He got, I, got, I learned a lot from him. And then I was a young kid in the business, and I went to another territory for Oklahoma, and Eddie Gilbert was my partner. But Eddie Gilbert was only 17. A lot of places he couldn't work because he wasn't old enough to get a wrestling license. But then I went back to Memphis. And I teamed up with a guy named Ken Lucas. And a lot of people tell me, Ricky Morton, you were the greatest baby face in this business. But no, Ken Lucas was the greatest baby face in this business. I teamed up with Ken and me and him went to Southwest Championship Wrestling, which was owned by Joe Blanchard, Tully Blanchard's dad. And Tully was the booker. Tully seen a lot in me then. Uh, I learned so much from Ken. I worked with Tully and Gino Hernandez. Guys, we had some unbelievable matches. But then Tully there, too, seen me as in a single. He brought, you know, and you're talking about managers. The best one that I left out was Bobby Heenan. Gosh, well, I mean, how did I leave him out, Wally? But uh, Nick Bockwinkle came in. And uh, Bobby Heenan see me wrestle. Ken Luke was in a match. So he set it up. It with Tully because you know he kept wrestling the same Scott Casey or somebody like that there, and they gave me a little push as a young kid. Tully did to work with Nick, uh, but understand, I mean, we were we were in a territory where Tully was the booker, his head owned it, me and Ken Lucas, and the territory did great. Uh, don't get me wrong, we didn't. I mean, we like the business is nowadays, but man, we did, we did great business. So, uh, as a Tully, I, uh, you know, as business wise, it has friendships. I'll see him every now and then. 
you know, I, I know his daughter real good, Tessa. Uh, I, I don't know why somebody hadn't signed her for a couple of million dollars a year. She's unbelievable. But, you know, she learned from her dad. You know, Tully had a a great, he's got a great mind for the business. I don't know if you know this or not. You're, you know, Tully was a, he played football at uh, West Texas State. It's where a lot of the boys played from. You know, I don't know if you know this or not, but Tully was quarterback there in college. You know, he was an, he was a true athlete. Man, I'm not bullshitting you. I tell you the best thing, you ought to, if you ever see Tully again, you ought to pass football with him. Because, man, he'll throw a football and, and knock your ass down with it. I ain't never seen somebody throw a football so hard in my life. But knowing Tully, did a lot of business with Tully, made a lot of money with Tully. Uh, he was he, he was a big part of the Four Horsemen. He's, and, and his interviews, gosh, great. Could you tell the story about uh, you saw him on this religious show? And he <laughs> of, uh, oh, got... I knew you was going to ask me that. <laughs> but but you know what? That happened a, another time too. You know, which, especially when you, uh, uh, especially when you don't want to be noticed. <laughs> you know, what I'm saying that was telling he was turning religious at the time, and uh, my first wife. Well, we got a divorce <laughs> after that, but you know, that's the way it was, dude. Uh, I was in a business that, that uh, had the world ahead of me, but, but she was turning religious. She said, Tully Blanchard's going to be on the 700 club tonight. And let's watch it. Lord and behold, here comes Tully out there. And it's not me and the boys. It's me and Ricky Morton. <laughs> ounces of cocaine women every night bye 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 and i will actually watch horns grow out on my mom's head at that time i just did a forward flip right out in the middle of the road and just laid there she dropped the elbow covered me one two three it was over with i was gone uh but you know and another time dude it, it's just your name being a part of something and hell I don't do that you know it's a lot let me tell you dude I partied a lot in my life but I was never with a girl that didn't want to be with me never underage never messed around with any of the boys girlfriends or their wives uh even after they broke up with them that, that wasn't I was, I'm one of the boy I'm one of the true boys no stayed away from them and understand that uh, that's the way I did that's the way I did things but now here I am with uh a guy that makes my, uh, he's a cripple boy. And uh, he's making uh, my DVDs for me. And he usually goes with me and helps me sell them. And I, he, and, and I called him. I says, will you, uh, he says, oh, I got to go out of town to do something. I said, all right, I'll meet you. But I never heard from him for like a week or two. And, do, and, and I'm watching. Remember, the sh did y'all get the show there called The Predator? Oh, to catch a predator, yeah. Yeah, to catch a predator. Yeah. <laughs> I'm watching this on TV. And they and the reason that got me to watch it is because they got a guy called the wrestling dude. And I said, the wrestling dude, I'm gonna start, you know, it caught my eye. So I watch this, and all of a sudden I look at it's Dustin, and he's reading off all this shit that he told this girl, and the girl ain't but like 12 years old. And I got it, and my, and my daughters were young at that time. And I said, God, I'd have killed this son of a bitch if he'd have done that to my kids. You understand me? But then they kept caught, and the guy, holy shit, man. I watched TV, and he asked this guy, he goes, why do you call yourself the wrestling dude? You know, because he's crippled. He goes, oh, I work for Ricky Morton of the Rock and Roll Express. <laughs> hey. I almost shit on myself. Well, you son of a bitch, shut up. You don't work for me. And you just make DVDs for me. Uh, it was, you know, after you think about it, it's funny as hell. Yeah. But it, but it wasn't at the time. And it's right now the thing with Tully. At the time, it wasn't. But now it's funny. Who gives a shit? You know, uh, I don't <laughs> I hate him for it because the marriage wouldn't have lasted anyway. Uh, 
you know, okay. I've been happily married a bunch of times, you know, no, I'm just, I'm, I'm lying to you. I've been, uh, after that, I, uh, you know, I've been married to the same woman after that all these years. Go ahead. Uh, just because Tully Blanchard is a, is a preacher. Have you heard about all this stuff going on with Ted DiBiase lately? Uh, I know Ted's a preacher, but I ain't heard what's going on. Tell me about it. What's up? Uh, well, I won't, I'm not an expert on it, but supposedly he received millions of dollars of welfare funding that was put into his ministries. And there's a big investigation going on over it now. Uh, well, you know what? Uh, I really don't have an answer for that. But one thing that I do, and, and you always remember this, bro. Uh, I believe, I believe in Jesus Christ. You hear me? I'm, uh, I'm a firm believer. Now I'm me. God knows me. I, I say my prayers to everybody and, and, and that stuff. But you see, when you mess with the religious stuff, it's going to come back and bite you. And the ultimate price you're going to pay is when your ass dies. Uh, uh, that's just the way to me. I look at it. Don't know what Ted's done. Uh, Ted's always been nice to me. I've always been nice with him. He is a hell of a worker, man. What great matches I had with him. Uh, matter of fact, you know, he, I was working him in the Superdome when Jimmy Crockett come to see us. And I told Ted, the way with Ted and Dr. Death, I said, Jimmy, a little man out here come to me, he come all the way from Charlotte, North Carolina. To watch us wrestle. I didn't know Jimmy Crockett at the time. He he goes, I'll never forget. Ted said, Well, we we'll give him something to see. But God, we did too. But uh getting on with the religious stuff. Uh, I know a lot of the boys. I've been at some of the wrestling sign-ins, you know, the Comic Cons, and they'd be sitting at the table, and all the boys sitting at the table are so-called religious guys. And I'm eating, and I'd get up my t- I'd get up from the table, go sit at another table, because I thought lightning was going to hit that son of a bitch. But it got him. I, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, yeah, all y'all going to burn in hell. I'm not bullshitting you. But uh, but there's a lot of legit guys out there. George South, you know, and I think Tully's really, you know, when I'm with, you know, t- I like the guys when they don't try to push it on you. You understand me? Yeah. I am. I know. I know as much as about the Bibles as a lot of them do, and it surprises them when they do stuff. You know, uh, me and Tully was talking one time, and and uh, we was talking about reading the Book of Johns, and but we said it at the same time. He goes, "Holy shit, you read that?" I said, "Yes." Yeah. So to me, it's the most meaningful chapter in the Bible. Uh, but uh, but George South, and then you know, the guys that come on to you that try to push it on to you. No, get away from me, man. I don't want to listen to you. You, uh, uh, that's not my thing, but go ahead, man. Y'all got carried away there for a second. There was a fan named Rick Brooks. He wanted to know if you had any experiences with mad dog, Buzz Sawyer over the years. Oh, I knew Buzz. Never had no experience with him. I uh, watched him and Tommy Rich just beat the living piss out of each other for a couple of years. Uh, you know, that's another underrated. I know we're talking about Bud Sawyer, but Tommy Rich, what an underrated wrestler after the years. And his, you know, in his time, he was the first Hulk Hogan, uh, first Steve Austin, the first Rock. And a lot of people don't even understand that. But, but you see, he had talent to work with him like Bud Sawyer. Bud Sawyer was an unbelievable heel. Uh, he'd party all night. <laughs> he said he'd party all night. I tell you what, I seen the what well, Sawyer do one time. Uh, me and Robert were coming from it. We were going to Tupelo, Mississippi, back to Memphis to do TV. And Buzz Sawyer was on, was in the territory doing something. And Robert, he spit, he chewed Copenhagen, and he'd spit it in the bottle, beer bottle. And Buzz Sawyer seen that. And Buzz says, man, what is that stuff right there? He says, and Robert told him. But but he thought Robert was drinking a beer out of the beer bottle, still spitting it in there. 
Yeah. So he put some in his mouth. And uh, hell, he didn't know you're supposed to spit it out. He's drinking beer with it. He ate on <laughs> about 10, and about 10 miles. He says, I pull this, pull this GD car over. But I pulled it over, four down raining. <laughs> I pulled over, he jumped out and hit. He threw up like a son of a gun. And where it was raining, there was water about a foot deep, and he laid off in that water. And I told him, I said, Buzz, get up out of the water. He says, hell no, it feels good. He was the sickest son of a bitch I've ever seen in my life. Man, that uh, next day at TV, still, man, he told me, he says, I turned purple. Yeah, are you a chewer? No, but okay. I've been yeah, around just, a lot of chewers. <laughs> oh, yeah, that should have. You know, Copenhagen's the main event, too, bro. You know, and he stuck that in his mouth. Holy shit, his whole world turned upside down. But no, I, you know, Buzz, at, at that time when Buzz was in Atlanta and stuff, I was working, you know, the Texas territories, the Kansas City territories, uh, Oklahoma territories before Bill Watts. You know, that's when Leroy McGurk had it. So, but, but I knew Buzz, knew his brother too. How did you get along with Ole Anderson in Atlanta? Ole Anderson. <laughs> Ole Anderson was another guy that didn't like uh, small guys. Uh, you know, we were over. We worked with the Midnight Express, and we shot that angle with the with the full horseman. And uh, to tell you the truth, now, uh, you, you know, everybody's going on vacation. You know, Jimmy Crockett's paying for the boys to go where they want to walk. But we got to work that week. And they called it the Rock and Roll Super Summer Sizzling Tour. And it was the angle off uh, of, uh, you know, where they run my face. And we were asking Ole and Arn. Yeah. Okay. Now, we're, we're at spot shows for the first week, but you know, the spot shows that only drew 300 people, man, we're going out on football fields doing, and I'm serious. I'm not just trying to pat myself on the back, but man, we're doing 20,000 people on football fields. And he'd tell me, he'd go, God, I don't know how this angle here is growing. I don't understand it. I don't know. Bob, Bob. So finally we get to the serious stuff. Hampton, Virginia, you know, the big Coliseum that, you know, the bicycle tape just showed, boom. And we're wrestling Ole and Arn, and they're in the ring, you know, naturally me and Robert hit the ring, boom, you know what I'm saying? But I got Ole in the corner, and I guess he thinks, since I'm a young kid, this is my first rodeo, I done hit him 750 times, you see what I'm saying? And he's just rocking on the top rope. So finally, I just stopped and I looked at him right in the eyes. I turned around. I walked back to the middle of the ring. And I just took a big old bump. Bam! By myself. He looked at me and said, what the hell are you doing? I said, fuck. I mean, you won't go down. I thought I would. Hey, <laughs> bro. <laughs> He told me, he says, I don't know whether to whoop your ass or shake your hand. <laughs> uh, he said, you got more balls than a Brahma bull. <laughs> I told him. I was, uh, but he knew. But what he's trying to do is blow me up. You know what I'm saying? To make me yeah. look. Yeah, I, I won my first rodeo. Man, I worked with the best of them. But you know, after that, this son of a bitch loved me. I mean, he, I mean, bro, he takes slams off the top rope. He he'd take bumps for me. You understand what I'm saying? And he yeah. and he wouldn't for nobody else. But you had to know Oli. Oli hated everything. I don't think he even liked ice cream. You uh, you understand me? This son of a bitch, <laughs> always bitching about something. But God, uh, uh, I learned a lot from Oli though. Don't get me wrong. It took me a while to get to to get to know him and for him to to know me. But uh. I mean, he was a true professor in our business. I can tell you that. And Tommy Rich was really over in that territory. I've heard that Tommy Rich and you guys had the most groupies. Is that true? Had the most what? Groupies, like in wrestling. I always hear groupies. Tommy Rich. I, I don't know about that. 
<laughs> you know what, bud? Uh, we were rock stars. You understand me? Tommy Rich was in Atlanta. I wasn't in Atlanta at the time Tommy was there. Uh, you know, Tommy, he started in Memphis, too. And the reason he went to Atlanta, he got pissed off at Jerry Jarrett. You know, Jerry Jarrett wouldn't give him the top push. You, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, it, was, it was owned by them. It was his way. So, you know, he went to Atlanta and Jim Barnett, my boy, you know, he, he seen something in Tommy Rich. But, you know, with Tommy Rich, you know, that's what guys got to say. You know, nowadays, you know, the young wrestlers, they have their – heroes in the wrestling business. And I'm going to tell you this. Tommy Rich was my hero. I'm older than Tommy. <laughs> but Tommy was, uh, he was one of my heroes in the wrestling business because he did it the hard way. Uh, I like Tommy. You know, you, you're talking about going a bit around the block. And I told you this earlier, I've been with a lot of women, but none of them that didn't want to be with me. Uh, didn't you know they wanted to i never and they was all but none of them none none of them were underage and i never messed with none of the boys girlfriends or their wives even after they broke up or split up i had nothing to do with them because i was one of the boys if you're talking about getting a lot of pussy yeah i got a lot of pussy bro <laughs> okay to, to, to put it to you blunt uh, had a lot of good times. Hell, dude, at that time, I didn't go to bed for 20 fucking years. So does that, does that tell you anything? Uh, yeah. Did a lot of partying, fella. Will wrestling ever be that way again with, with that many girls? Because I don't think No, no, like no, 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 no. Our, our world has changed. Uh, uh, you know, now that I'm scared to say hi to, to a lady, you know. I, I live in a small town once you know everybody, but hell, you don't even know in nowadays what's really going on in the world. You know, I was in New York, you know, for this coronavirus, and I'm not bullshitting you, man. I uh, I was walking to a building, and a lady was behind me, so I just opened the door up for her, let her go in front of me. Boy, she pointed that finger in my face and says, "I'm not gonna tip you." <laughs> I'm like, "What the? Where in the hell did that come from?" But uh, a lot of stuff like that, man. I just, you know, now our, our world has changed, uh, you know, about that. No, th no, it'll never come back to that again. Well, you know, I'm, I'm telling you, you just go back and watch some of our old matches and watch me coming to the ring. I posted one not long ago, about me coming to the ring, wrestling flair. You know, they literally tore my clothes off before I got to the ring. Uh you know, it not only the security, it took the security and the police to get my ass into the ring uh, because of that. You know, was, I was known as a rock star and it was fucking cool as hell. Now, there was a rare match of you in the AWA with uh, Robert against the British Bulldogs. How did that whole thing come about? Oh, that that, that wasn't in AWA, but that was for uh, no. that was for uh, uh, Baba. Japan. Oh, okay. Yes, that was Baba for Japan. I don't know who posted that. That was in, you know, let me tell you about this match now. Uh, Baba come over to do a taping in the States and they did it in Kansas City. Uh, and what you don't know is that we did it in that old memorial building in Kansas City, us against the British Bulldogs and we, in this 30 minute match. Well, what you got to understand, dude, it was three feet of snow on the ground. It had it was below zero the temperature, and that old building, man. You, I mean, just I was I couldn't warm up. I couldn't give the mats that I wanted to, uh, because until they played our music and I come out that curtain, dude, I had an overcoat on, hat, gloves. I was free. I'm a southern boy. My ass was freezing to death, and uh, but that was. For uh, because we was the baby face tag team and they were the baby face tag team, they didn't want to beat each other, so was just going to do a 30 minute Broadway. But that was for Baba's old Japan wrestling. Uh, Robert, that's where Robert now that, that was the first company we ever worked for, uh, in Japan. Okay, 
Yes. How did you how did you meet Robert anyways? Just to ask that question. Well, no, he uh you know, he was a tag team wrestler too. He uh his brother wrestled, Ricky Gibson. You know, and he was one of the he was a great baby face too, buddy. He was a hell of a worker. Uh he uh him did they wrestled us, Ricky and Robert Gibson in Memphis. You know, they was an underneath team. Uh I knew Robert for a long time. I knew Robert before. Yeah, I wrestled Robert several times, you know, before we became the Rock and Roll Express uh, in territories. He wrestled, before, you know, in Pensacola, little territories, uh, Memphis for Nick Goulas out of Nashville. Uh, I, I knew him that way. So you just business. gravitated towards each other? Well, no, yeah, I mean, he was just my friend. Now, see, the, in order to become the Rock and Roll Express now, this is what I'm going to tell you, and it, and we talked about this earlier, because we played second fiddle to the Fabulous Ones in Memphis. I was wrestling in San Antonio. Me and Ken Lucas were partners, and uh, and and Jerry Lawler came into the territory that night to wrestle Tully, I think. But when he was there, he, he, he got me and took me into a room and told me, he says, listen, now, uh, me and Jerry Jarrett are not getting along right now, and I'm going to go opposition of him. Do you know what I mean by opposition? Yeah. Okay, he was going to open up his own territory. He says, they got the fabulous ones. I want to bring you and Robert Gibson and think of some gimmick to put y'all together to go against Jerry Jarrett. Well, you know, going back to Memphis is going home for me. You understand me? Uh, my run was about up with Ken Lucas. Uh, I was looking for something new because I wanted to be a tag team wrestler and I knew Robert. So, uh, gave my notice and, and Lord and behold, when we got to Memphis, Jerry Jarrett and Lawler had done made up. So he's not going opposition. So now naturally Jerry Jarrett, we're second fiddle to the fabulous ones. But brother, we <laughs> and we didn't even have a gimmick. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm gonna tell you, uh, Lawler, you know him, Dutch Mantel and Jimmy Hart were trying to think of a gimmick. You know, uh, 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 Ricky, Robert, R and R, Rolls Royce, uh, and Jimmy Hart, Rock and Roll, the Rock and Roll Express. So now we, we come up with that. And so we tried to look at magazines, and I bought some. Me and Lawler bought some old rock star, you know, magazines back then. And uh, we kind of come up with some gimmicks, you know, oh, with us a gimmick there. I'm going to tell you, dude, our, they done plugged us on TV. We're going to be at the Mid-South Coliseum. For some reason, we did TV on that Saturday, which we did every Saturday. But Memphis was on Sunday afternoon. But they usually do, Memphis, I think, they had a basketball game going to be there on that Monday night. And we, uh, so they had to the wrestling on uh, Sunday. And hell, dude, at 12 o'clock, I met Lawler at the Coliseum. They had a flea market out back of the Coliseum, big old flea market. And we went over there and bought our gimmicks, feathers, bandanas. Oh, y'all see this shit. I was embarrassed. Me and Robert both were embarrassed as hell to go. Out. We never did nothing like this. We got shit all over us. We went out to, to wrestle, dude. Let me tell you, we we went out and wrestled uh, to the guys there in Memphis. And uh, son of a bitch, we had our stuff together. We were we were over. You hear me? Instantly. Yeah. But when we come out of the ring, I never forget. Some guy told me, "Said damn, I didn't know if y'all was Indian Indians or gypsies." <laughs> <laughs> me either, bro. But it, but chemistry in the ring, Robert and I clicked because we were both tag team wrestlers, and we knew what we were doing, uh, and it did. I mean, we, uh, dude, we could tear a house down in a heartbeat, and you know, and chemistry, we it fell together. We did a lot of good shit, man. A lot of good stuff. Did WWE ever reach out to you in the 80s when you got... Not really. No, no, no. The only reason we was there was WWF. 
Uh, first of all, the first thing we did was uh, we worked at Ingo with Smoky Mountain with Tom Pritchard and Jimmy Del Rey because they were going to WWF and the Smoky Mountain. They worked a gimmick where they went to now wrestle them on, on their pay-per-view. We wrestled Jimmy Del Rey and uh, Tom Pritchard. And, and then after Smoky Mountain closed down, and that's just the reason I like Jimmy Cornette. You see, and this is, he's, even though you might not agree with him, but he took care of us. We didn't have no job. Right. So, you know, he taught Vince and breaking us in as the NWA versus the WWF. You see what I'm saying? Bro, it was me, Barry Wonderman, Robert, and I think Jeff Jarrett. Uh, and, but you see, it, it was so much going on at WWF. We was just lost in the shuffle. But one thing about it, we didn't have signed paper contract, but just being there, they paid us so much a week until that ran out. <laughs> you know, you ever heard that story? Uh, you know, Rock and Roll's here to stay or until the money runs out. But uh, that was <laughs> part of what we did, Bo. How was the dressing room in WWF compared to WCW and NWA? Oh, but yeah, it's, you know, it's about the same because you, you know, you have your, your people that are on top, you know, WCW, uh, you know, you had your superstars that thought they were superstars that didn't have a clue. You know, they bankrupt the fucking company, uh, paid their self. You know, you know, some of these guys walk to their mailbox every week, and got a check for 80 fucking grand. I'd wrestle naked for 80 grand. You know what I'm saying? One time. Yeah. But they got it. A check. They got stuff like that every week, you know. But I, uh, uh, it, you know, it's a totally different thing. Our days, the boys took care of each other. But you got to see it. But back in the NBA days, you know, we came fake. You know, you didn't sit down and go over your matches. Uh, hell, you never seen the heel. You never seen the heels of the baby faces till you got in the ring. Uh, we so, so strict, you know, and especially us. We never got our finish till we got in the ring. We didn't, you know, you didn't go over matches. You didn't go over hot spots. And uh, all they would, would and we'd do it in the ring, you know. Uh, Tommy Young say the, the heels are going to fuck y'all in the match. Or he says, baby face over. Uh, or Broadway, either one of the three, and you did it yourself in the ring. You hear me? We were professional enough and knew where our angles were going, and it did good. Uh, it's you know, it's back then, you, you'd never seen the baby face. Hell, for Bill Watts, man, Jesus Christ, you got talk, you had caught talking to him, the heel baby face, or the heel talk. That's that's even out of the. You know, in the public, you were fired. I never forget this right here. This really blew my mind. I knew Johnny Walker wrestling too for years. I've known him for years, but I never seen him with his mask off. And I, I'm not bullshitting you. You know, uh, and I was at Walmart. I never forget this. In Alexandria, Louisiana, that's where we lived at. And I'm uh, I'm back there looking at Walmart. And the guy walks up to me. Says, Started talking to me, and I didn't know who the hell he was. I, I knew the voice. I never told him this. I knew the voice, but it took me a few minutes to realize, fuck, it was wrestling too. Just as I'd never seen Johnny Walker with his hood off. That's how kayfabe our business was. And wow. uh, it blew my mind. And I knew him for years too. You know, he had two masks. I mean, he, uh, you know, he put his mask on. And then, you know, even when he took a shower, he took his other mask. He took one mask. I had one all up under it, a little thin one. Uh, so I didn't know who in the hell he was. Uh, I mean, that's how kayfabe our business was and the difference between the locker rooms because baby faces never seen each other. Uh, and the heels never seen each other when our business was really the business. And how was working with the Road Warriors? Uh, Animal and Joe. Uh, 
Same thing, dude. Uh, this is in Louisiana, our territory. Like, man, we done popped this territory, but we got her going. Hawk and uh, an animal, Joe and Mike. I never met these guys. We're at the Superdome, and first time I ever worked with them. You heard about them beating people up. You heard about them hurting people. But you got to understand this. Louisiana was our territory. Okay? I got to go out there and wrestle these guys, and I can't let them kill me off. And if I do, I have to take, you know, I got to take an ass whooping. Because, you know, uh, you know, fuck, if you shoot them, you piss them off. Uh, so I went to the ring, and, and boy, really, uh, there's a difference between, because but we're in Superdome, that's 40,000 people, dude. Half of the Superdome's cut in half with a big curtain. And the people are so loud, you can't hear nothing. And we're in a, a eight-man elimination match. It, it's the first time I ever met him now. You know, Joe and Mike became great friends of mine after all this. But uh, I have to stand up for me. I mean, if it's if it's an ass whooping, but I don't want to go in there. And I remember Terry Gordy and Joe, which is Animal, started the match off. And I guess they just come back from Japan. And holy shit. They are hitting each other so hard. Bam, the big old fuckers, man. Bam, bam, bam. And Terry Gordy takes a bump and he tags me. <laughs> I went, holy shit. Now, you got to know when people are business and when they're not business. I, I, I don't know. I just know I rode in the ring. Joe grabbed me. He says, duck my clothesline, hit me with the drop kick and hit. Hawk with the drop kick when he comes in. So I did that. I hit Joe with the drop kick. He went over the top rope. I hit Mike with one. He went over the top rope out on the floor. I'm standing in the middle of the ring. 40,000 people are hollering rock and roll with my thumb up my ass. Because you know what? After all that, they were business. They knew. Okay? I didn't have to tell them. They knew. So that's my, my first impression of them. They were business guys. Uh, and matter of fact, they put us over. Uh, but then, as the years when I, I worked territories with them, you know, I came, you know, even right now, me and Joe are good friends. Joe's my buddy. <laughs> Animal, you know, when Hawk died, he, he passed away. Hawk was a, he was a crazy son of a bitch. But, uh, you know, they, they left their mark in the wrestling business. You know, man, they... They were something new too to our business. They started a new trend too. Is it true that Robert had a bit of a tough guy reputation backstage? Ah, uh, well, I mean, they the part about being tough. You know, you know what? In our in our business, in any business, uh, it a lot of people be tough, but that first lick's a son of a bitch. <laughs> you understand me? Uh, I try not to fight. I really follow the boys. I mean, but uh, we, uh, being who we are, we were the little guys, and we ran into, uh, you know, I, I don't know, but when trouble happened, you know, yeah, Robert could, you know, Robert was a tough, motherfucker. You hear me? He, uh, you know, it, it's it's like me, I, you know. I was tough enough to take an ass whooping. You see, and in our, in our business, in any business, if somebody knows you're a fight, they, they won't fight with you. They just don't want to waste their time. You know what I'm saying? Uh, if you know they're going to fight. Our big thing, I remember our first, well, this is for Baba. When we first went on our first tour to, uh, to Japan, they had a team there called Footloose. They were the Rock and Roll Express of Japan. And, uh, you know, we're there for a month for, you know, the for we hadn't worked with them yet, but I watch, see, that's what I, I always watch the matches for in case I work with you. I know what you do, what you don't do, what kind of spots to call. Uh, but, and I knew we were going to work with them. It's like two weeks in the match. And I asked, we worked with them. They told us to go 30 minutes through. So I asked them, you know, through the, you're going to do hot spots. They looked at me. 
So I get no hot spot, no hot spot. I'm like, okay, what the fuck? So uh, we go to the ring and we're supposed to go 30 minutes, Broadway. And we get the ring and one of them hauls off an open hand slaps Robert. When he did that, it was about 30 seconds. Robert had him bit over that rope. This fucker looked like Elephant Man. And his face is all so Robert beat the living fuck out of him. And then he jumped out of the ring and both of them went back to the heel dressing room. And I looked at Robert. I says, well, I guess we're fired. He goes, hell, we was looking for a job. We found this son of a bitch. He jumps out of the ring, goes straight back in. You know, you didn't do that there. He went right in their dressing room. I'm right behind him. The guy was sitting there. He walked over and footballed him right in the damn face. All the Japanese boys and everybody comes in and gets us out. And I said, holy fuck. Didn't know what was happening. Uh, but the next day, we're on the bus. So, and we're pulling up to the building. And I told Robert, I said, man, there's a two foot loose guys. They're standing right there waiting for us to pull up. You know, I, I don't know. They're right there. So, uh, hell, me and Robert ran to the front of that bus. That door opened up. And we jumped off right there in front of them. But it, but we didn't know. You know, you, you got to stand your ground, bro. In this business, you got to be who you are. <laughs> and uh, we jumped off. They're standing in front of us. And they go, look in front of us. They're real straight. They go, tonight we do many many hot spots like this right here and then they picked our bags up and carried them in the door so i guess we got their attention got their respect uh but robert he he can handle himself you know what i'm saying he's to be an old fucker he still does were you in wcw when uh, eric watts had his scuffle with rick rude no I, I didn't know they even had a scuffle. Tell Apparently they did, yeah. Some, a bunch of people have told the story, but I guess it was before or after your time there. Uh, I don't know. I, 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 did, I know Rick Rude. I, I don't know what Eric's doing fucking with Rick Rude. <laughs> I, but I don't know. I don't know the situation, what happened, you know. Uh, I, did I, I, I What's that? I was going to just say, how did you like when they turned you uh, heel in WCW? Well, I, uh, it wasn't a part. Uh, I didn't have a job. Okay. Uh, Robert Knee was out. I didn't. Uh, Robert blew his knee out real bad. And he was out for a year. Uh, they turned me heel for I could have a job. And uh, if you noticed, when Robert came back from his knee surgery, I arrested him on pay-per-view and I beat him. And then him left and went to smoke. We left that night and I went to Smoky Mountain Wrestling. <laughs> okay. I didn't even give my notice. I just told him hell with it. Uh, I, I loved working with Terry Taylor. And uh, Alexandria York, which is Terry Reynolds. You know what? We had a decent gimmick, and it and it got over. But they didn't want us over. Uh, do you understand me? The people run the business didn't want me and Terry to be over. They didn't want it to work. We were another. They they because we and Terry go to the ring, and uh, they were great. Uh, you know. I, I never forget one time me and Terry Taylor we go on to the, we went to the ring and that's that's when Todd Champion I don't know if you remember him yeah and Curtis Thompson they were teamed up and Todd Champion's just coming back he's been out for a while but dude he's all steroid up he's like this right here and here's Curtis Thompson he's real big he ain't got no neck this is how bad to me a lot of people don't know and WCW pushing people that they uh, shouldn't be pushing. And, and, and Todd Champion just came back. He was, uh, you know, uh, I just call him Todd Green, want to be a champion. <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. But, uh, and, but it, you know, he just came back to work. You know, he's been on a hell of a cycle, all steroid up, and Curtis Thompson. And 
And, I, and we start the match. I start the match off, and he slams me. And I told him, I said, Todd, I said, just a little harder, and I'll go plump through the ring. So uh, I said, tag Curtis in. His name's Curtis Thompson. Uh, Chip, the far breaker, or <laughs> whatever his name was. So uh, he tags him in. And, and God, man, he hit me so hard. And Terry run in because he said it. And, and I seen three of Terry. And Terry asked me, says, are you all right? I said, yeah, Terry, I'm all right. But these guys are killing me. So I hauled off and hit Terry Taylor, the one in the middle <laughs> of the right. three I seen. Hey. And then me and, him, me and him had a match. And they're standing over there about the rope in their corner. Me, me and Terry have about a 10-minute match. I uh, roll them up, one, two, three, go back to the dressing room. <laughs> hey, and Grizzly Smith is agent. He's, what are y'all doing? I says, man, I, what am I doing? I said, won't you go out there and work with them two guys? They're killing me. I can't. I said, I, look here, me and Terry Taylor had a very better match wrestling each other than we did with them. So uh, that was my Was that a TV yeah. taping or was that a house show? Uh, it was a house show in Phoenix, Arizona. Okay. But it got over like a son of a bitch. <laughs> but, you know, just working it back and forth. It was good. You obviously got along with Terry. Why do you think a lot of people didn't get along with Terry? Was it just because he was in an office position? Or? Uh, well, I, I really don't know. You know, I got to say this for Terry, too. He got a set of balls on him. You know, he didn't take no shit from nobody. Uh, he'd stand up for himself. Uh, but a lot of guys are like that. But, you know, he'd stand up. I, Hell, I seen him and the sheep get to fight one time. I'm talking about Kaz. Uh You know, Terry wasn't afraid to get his ass whooped. And, uh, but uh, I really don't know. I guess Terry's outspoken. A lot of us don't. Yeah, I don't know, dude. I used to be. I don't know if it's because I got older and metal out or medication yeah. doctor put me on. I don't know. <laughs> What was the thing with Terry and uh, Iron Sheik over? Oh, they get into it about in a bar, and uh, you know what? And they both of them drinking. And, and I gotta say this, man, it was in the and, and Terry. He hit <laughs> Cos, but see, Terry was smart. He hit him, boy. He took a bump. Cos did, and, and he took off running. Terry did. <laughs> Next day. We're at the Omni, and the Sheik, you got you got to know the Sheik. The Sheik is, I, I love him, man, but he's he's funnier than shit. He's there at four o'clock. He he's he's got his shoot. You know, Cos had, a, I call him Cos, but he the Iron Sheik. You know, he had a, a a shooting outfit and a working outfit. He had an outfit to go over and an outfit to lose in. <laughs> It was, you know what I'm saying? No, he had his shooting shit on. And he was there, buddy. He was there at four o'clock, man. He's waiting for Terry Taylor to come in the door. But Dusty got a hold up wind of it and calmed it down. <laughs> Funny. Uh, don't say USA, God damn it. <laughs> Is he really like that uh, off camera, or was that kind of an angle for you? No, two? that was it. No, that's his idea. Have you never met Darn Sheik? Just uh, in recent years when he's not doing too well health-wise now. Yeah, man, he's <laughs> he was crazy, dude. I remember uh, we were going to Columbus, Georgia to do a TV taping. And we were riding with Michael Hayes and Jimmy Garvin. Me and Kaz were in the back. And, uh, and on the highway it goes. You, you have to know the sheet to understand this. My, it said roadblock up ahead. Drug check. Whether Jimmy Carver and Michael both had a bag of weed. They go, oh my God, it's a road check. They handed it back to Cos and told him to throw it out the window. Well, he rolled the window down, but he hit throw it out. He just put it in his pants. But when we got down there, it was where you got off the exit or they had that. We didn't even get off of that exit. And Michael Hayes was going, holy shit, man, we threw our weed out. We didn't have to do this. or well, We didn't have to do it. And then Kyle pulls them both out. 
and uh, they go, oh, thank you so much. And, uh, oh, thank you, my ass. This belongs to Sheik. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Sheik, take care of Sheik. Sheik, keep. <laughs> you had to be there to understand this. It was that's the way Sheik was. He was funny and then shit, man. Uh you know, he'd come up with some, you know, I don't know if you remember a guy named Doug Furnace. Yes. He was real big in in J- Japan. But you know, he did a little deal with him. You know, and Sheik could grab the microphone, he'd get away with anything because he speak broken English. You know, he'd get on a microphone and call him. Duck fuckness. <laughs> you know, he can get away with that. Hey, but you know, the office didn't even catch on to what he was doing. But I I did <laughs> Doug Fuckness. You know, I think he passed away, didn't he, Doug Furnace? Uh I'm not I'm sure. sure. The last, I know he was treating men with Phil LaFon for a long time, but I haven't heard of them wrestling forever. Uh no, I, he passed away. Doug did. Yeah, sure did. I know he did. And for the Freebirds, how were they to work with? Uh, Terry Gordy. You know, Terry Gordy was a big boy. He was big. Hell, he when he was 16 years old, he was heavyweight champion. You know, this is years ago before you had the athletic commissions. He was just a natural. He was great. Michael Hayes is one of the best talkers at that time. That's what really got them over with, in Buddy Roberts. But but Michael, you know, I don't. Have you ever seen the the dictionary for for professional wrestling? And it, and it has. And, and you look up stiff. Okay, that's and when you look it up. It's a picture of Michael Hayes standing beside that son of a bitch. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Michael had no. Uh, when you were in the ring with him, he didn't know that you was in the ring with him. You know what I'm saying? You'd be hit, turn around, pop, and ship side the head. Knee and nuts, you know, no concept that you was in the ring with him. I seen a, I remember years ago, uh, especially down south here, uh, Don and Jackie Fargo were really, really over. You know, and they were big times in the south. But Don Fargo, Michael Hayes is working with him, and he's going to get kids all her. So he put on his finger, laid on his finger. Look at he didn't know <laughs> he never did this before. Look here, he went out there and he and Don Farco come back. He was cut all up. He done, you know, he looked like a jigsaw puzzle. <laughs> he cut him up. Uh, but uh the free birds were over, bro, especially in Dallas, Texas. They had a hell of a run with the Von Ericks. And uh but Michael tear out, you know, the Robert and 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 Michael grew up together you know, as kids. They used to hitchhike to the TV station every Saturday in Pensacola, Florida to put the ring up. Uh, that was their way of breaking into the business and refereeing. Uh, you know, and you know, Robert's real name is not Robert Gibson. It's Reuben. And uh, Michael still calls him Reuben. He never calls him Robert. It's always Reuben. That's where they grew up together. And you feuded with the gangsters in uh, Smoky Mountain Wrestling. How was working with New Jack? It was, uh, yeah, it was an experience. <laughs> they, uh, they, you know what? Especially at that time, you know, we, we're down, down south. Uh, this is right after the, and don't get me wrong, when, when I talk about this interview, please don't think anything bad about me or, or any of that, but it's, uh, this is, uh, this is in the early nineties, uh, during Smoky Mountain wrestling, you know, times were different then. He, you got these two gangsters come in, Robert and I, all American white baby faces. Uh, and they really, you know, here they come out on TV, eating watermelon, and fried chicken. Really, really putting white people down. And that's right after they, uh, on TV, well, Rodney King got beat up, uh, you know, in California. <laughs> and we did an angle where they Rodney King me. Okay. And New Jack, he drove a Corvette, but it's, you know, it's a badass car. And I told him, I says to Jack, listen, bud, you need to park 
that Corvette and go buy you a two or three hundred dollar car because you could buy two or three hundred dollar cars in and uh and drive i said because these fans are gonna tear your car and then and then he did uh he had an old van <laughs> look here man they knocked the windows out of it cut his tires i think he carried a set of tires at the back of it uh yeah there's a lot of heat a lot of heat you know uh and, and I'm not into racial shit, but you know, but don't off that TV. Holy shit. They, they him and Mustafa both, they, uh, you know, but it was a learning process for New Jack in Smoky Mountain because when he left here, he went to ECW and uh, he really had a good run there. You know, made, made himself some, you know, he did good to self in the bit. He did good for himself there. Helped him out a lot. Were you surprised Terry Reynolds ended up dating him for a while? Nah. Ain't none of my business. <laughs> you know, none of, that's none of my business. Uh, you know, both of them, you know, have something to say, but I don't listen. It's, you know, that's not my business, bro. You know, no, no. I, if she liked him, he liked her. It's, don't bother me a bit. How was uh, Tammy Sitch back in the Smoky Mountain days? How you talking about Tammy Finch? Or, yeah. Sonny? Yeah. <laughs> you know what, man? She, you know, she was there. She dated Chris Candido then. I love Chris. Chris, I have a worker. Gosh, man. Uh, he left his world way too soon. He was... Man, he, he was absolutely wonderful. But Tammy, you know, she was a, at that time, you know, we was all young at one time. She was beautiful. Uh, she had her ways, you know. Uh, back then, she was real straight. At that time, I smoked cigarettes. I don't, you know, I quit smoking. I don't. Hell, I did a lot of drugs, smoked a lot of cigarettes. She, you know, she'd bitch about me smoking, uh, bitch about me being fucked up. And then, Brother, she did a she did a complete turnaround, you know. Now I'm cleaned up and she's fucked up all the time. But that's her own business. It's none of mine. I always liked Sonny. She uh like I told you earlier, I treated people the way they treated me. You're nice to me, I'm nice back. If you're an asshole, I treat you back like an asshole. Did she ever come on to you or anything over the years because she was no No, no. You know, that's another thing. I I was telling you earlier, and I'm repeating myself. I never messed around with the, the, I never, one time in my life, never, I, I never messed with the girls in our business. Uh, I respected them. I didn't care what they done. Uh, I know them all from, from Missy Hyatt to, you know, Deborah, Medusa. They were all friends of mine. Uh, you know, uh, no, I didn't. I didn't come on to them. I didn't uh, mess with them like that. I, I respected the girls, and I still do. You know, like on independent shows, the girls come in there. I make a, you know, I tell the, all the guys to get up, let the girls get dressed, or, or go in the bathroom and tell somebody to watch the door. Because uh, I, I still respect that. You know, that's what I hate about the independent wrestling now days. Uh, because I'm from the old school, but when I really get on their ass too, uh, the guys, the men, I'll be not going to the dressing room. I said, who's the girl? Oh, it's my girlfriend. Your girlfriend's in the dressing room here where the guys are getting dressed. Uh, oh yeah. Oh yeah. I'll cut interviews on them. Get them. You know, they try to do that. And then, uh, then sometimes what I do is, uh, especially if Robert's on the show, yeah, and, and I'll say this, you know, I don't know if you know the difference between me and Robert with the, I walk up and put it in, he puts it in and walks up. I just <laughs> tell him, yeah, all right, listen to me. <laughs> hey, take your clothes off, Robert. <laughs> and, you know, he, people ask me all the time, he says, I come in, he, he walk around the dressing room naked. I said, I had a dick like that, I'd wrestle naked. I ain't shit. You duck the dick liner, motherfucker. <laughs> dick drag. <laughs> but, but I'm serious. I just tell the because you know I, I I don't know what these young talent 
even thinking about. This is the dressing room. And here you got your girlfriend in here. What, listening to your match, going over your spots? Listen to this. This is where the guys get dressed at. Get the fuck out of here. Now, a lot of times they don't have two dressing rooms, but that's like I was telling you other, the lady wrestlers. I make all the guys go out. I said, man, y'all go out for these girls to get dressed. They're over dressing behind a towel or something. I said, go out of here. Uh, but that's uh, my feelings about that right there. I always, so I, I never mess with none of the girl wrestlers. I never did. What was your reaction when you first heard about the Midnight Rockers? Oh, I thought it was a compliment. A lot of people, you know, they didn't make me. I, I know Sean. You know, Sean was in Louisiana with us when he was a kid. When Robert and I were, uh, you know, he worked underneath. Uh, and then Marty Gennetti. I, I know Marty for a long time. And, and you know, and that's the Ferns thing. And what Neil Fern got yet didn't put that together. The Midnight Rockers. They took the Rock Will Express and the Midnight Express. It's just a trip downtown, bro. You know, they're trying to make a little money. They're trying to get over. Sometimes you go to extremes, and sometimes you have to listen to the booker. Didn't bother me a bit. Didn't, you know, because I know what me and Robert are, did, and I know what we're capable of and what we did do. And Marty Gennetti is a pretty good guy. Have you had much talk with him over the years? Oh, I see Marty all the time. But, you know, his, his foot messed up. You know, uh, we all have our demons, and Marty still does. I, uh, you know, you try to talk to him, but uh, sometimes you're better off talking to a, a tree than to talk to people. Uh, and in, in, in situations like that, life passes you by so quick. You know, it's, it seems like yesterday, it was 1985, and you know, that's, God darn, that's 35 years ago. You hear me? Just that quick. And you can't live in yesterday. And nobody cares no more. Yeah, yeah nobody cares. Did Shawn Michaels treat you respectfully when you were in the WWE in later years? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He, he did a, Shawn was a cool guy, man. Uh, you know, I watched him grow up in the business. You know, I've got to say that. He's the second to me being a baby face. <laughs> if you don't believe me, just ask me. I told you that twice. <laughs> He's, uh, you know, he had a great time. He had a hell of a run. He, uh, You see, uh, our business is being at the right place at the right time and knowing what to do when they, uh, when they ask you to it without hesitation. That's why I have wrestling schools to teach people this. Uh, you know, Sean, you know, he's in small territory too. He just, he just didn't happen to wake up one day. You know, uh, he went on his own. And, uh, dude, you can't blame him for that. I mean, look where he is now. He's yeah. still with WWE. And there was a fan question from Zachary Carter that wanted to know, how was the money when you were working for Jim Crockett Promotions when you guys were headlining the card compared to when you were working the undercard for, like, Dusty and Flair? Uh, oh, no. Okay. Uh, this is this is all my fault, okay? Because I wasn't educated enough to know. We were breaking records, but I was working on top. And I'm going to tell you this right here. Uh, see, because I can't blame nobody but myself. Jimmy Crockett absolutely robbed us blind. Uh, that's how come they bought new airplanes and they bought this and they bought uh, things like that. Right there. For instance, you know, my biggest year. And the business was $125,000. You okay? That was for only one year. And then when I got a divorce, that was gone. You hear me? It's completely gone. Uh, you take, for this, at the 1986, I think they came out with the, the Rock and Roll Express fan club. And then that fan club, I just posted some other day, you know, you got a life-size poster, a record, 
uh, you know, are you part of the fan club that sold for nineteen ninety five? And that's why I have a, you know, I, I did a, a record that's actually horrible. Instead of being, you know, a lot of them go platinum and go, mine went plywood. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, but no, it sold over a million copies. The Rock and Roll Fan Club sold over a million copies for 1995. You can literally say that's $20 million. I mean, Robert didn't get a dime of it. They screwed us. And then when it was too late, we tried to sue them, but they already declared bankruptcy. You, you understand me? So we got nothing. But this is what I'm trying to tell all young wrestlers out there in our head. Get your education. Uh, don't let this business get caught up in this business and the position you're in. Because I have people. See, I, when I worked on top, guys, and this is what's different about nowadays. There's a lot of people that worked here, a lot of people that worked here, but when you work here, and when I'm talking about working here, when you have people dependent on you to feed their families. That's the reason I never had no problem with the boys in the business is because I fed them. We sold out houses. Everything everything we did. And that's, we you was on a pay rate of that. Uh, but like I'm trying to tell you, dude, Sometimes things are good. Sometimes, the t- you know, it's bad. But literally, uh, I mean, it was actually robbed. So it's nobody's fault. I'm not mad at nobody. It's my own fucking fault because I didn't have the education enough to know that they were screwing me royally. And I didn't even get a kiss. There was another fan, Jen Sullivan, wanted to know what your biggest disagreement with Robert was over the years behind the scenes. Do uh, do you really know Robert? I know I don't know him other than watching your matches. Hey, me and Robert hadn't never seen eye to eye. You don't get that, do you? <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's a joke. One of Robert's eyes go like this. Okay. Okay. Me and him <laughs> never seen eye to eye. <laughs> That's a joke. I love Robert. I can get away with that. Anybody else, you can't. Uh, uh, <laughs> not you know what move would I've been with Robert more than I have been with my wife. You hear me? Thirty I mean we've been together what like 37, 38 years. You know, before we even cut but now I've been on the road with him. I mean you it's like being married to him. You know, it's like being with your wife, disagreements. I mean <laughs> holy shit, we that's a lot of the boys on the road. They love to get us going. Me and Robert going in the dressing room. All because we have me and him a bitch fight with each other. But all, but everything we ever done, we never once tried to hit each other. Never once threatened each other. You know, we we fought like cat and dogs. Hey, we fight. I <laughs> mean, him fight more than me and my wife do. <laughs> okay, but it's uh. This over little shit, who's right and who's wrong, that don't really mean nothing, you know. But Roberts, uh, and I told this on the WWE Hall of Fame when they put, we got inducted in there uh, at the end of it. I told him that, you know, and I meant it from my heart. I love him just like he's my own brother. I've been with him more than my own brothers. So, yeah. I mean, we have that bond together. And how was working with Paul Heyman over the years? I know he was in WCW with you at the same time. Uh, I knew Paul. I didn't, re- you know, I never did uh, angles with him. You know, I went, when he was at WCW, yeah, you know, I did a little bit with him in ECW. He just brought me in. He was just a friend of mine. Uh, you know, Paul's uh, Paul's uh, got a great mind on him too, but he, and then when we was talking about managers early, I forgot to mention him. He's, you know, I knew Paul when he's a little bitty skinny guy, had a head full of hair. Uh, but <laughs> but time goes on. Uh, I never had no problems with Paul. You've managed to keep your hair. Any hair tips for anyone out there? Uh, well, no, no, no. See, I, I have the mullet. And, and when you have the mullet, you can cover up a lot of it. <laughs> you hear me? Hair tips, you know, it's like 
you know, Robert lost his hair. I was telling Robert that we were somewhere. It's back in the winter time, and it was cold as a son of a bitch. And Robert was talking about his hair. I said, Robert, I mean, you could always shave your head and go as a Russian. He said, a Russian? I said, yeah. I said, you call yourself Balls Frozen Off. <laughs> 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 no, but... Uh, no, dude, it's, you know, how hair is, it runs in your family line, you know, it's in your genes. Yeah. Uh, I'm lucky. I got, no, but I'm thin haired right here in the back. It's just that it's long enough. I, 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 I'm not at the point where I have to do the comb over yet, but when I do that, you know, but, but inside my pigments right here are real light. It's where I bleached my hair for years and it, 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 I guess kill the pigments in my hair right here on in my skin line. See right here. Yeah. So that's uh Well, you're doing a lot better than me, and I'm younger than you, so I'm jealous. <laughs> <laughs> I got you, buddy. For the NWA angle in WWE, a lot of fans wanted to know if you think they could have worked that better and made it a big success. For for when they brought you with Jim Cornette in WWE? No, no, yeah, no, no, buddy. You know what? When you when you have two big companies like that, we we worked on top. Nowadays, see, this is what really, and I really think what really hurts the business is that you bring people that work on top in one company to work on top of your company. And don't get me wrong, I love people, but you're taking a product that they don't want and you bringing it to yours and you're seeing the same shit all the time. That's the reason you, you, it seems like you see the same shit all the time. I knew that when I, you know, we worked in WA with two different companies. Uh, I knew when I went to the part of going to WWF, I, I knew what was going to happen. You know, they weren't going to let us get over any of their boys, but which they didn't need to, you know, we're a whole different company. But, you know, as nowadays is watching TV. And, and, and I'm glad for the guys. Don't get me wrong. These are great talents. And some of them are in great positions. But you just can't bring everybody. Because you just, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. What you don't, what you don't want, you, you're trying to give it a push here. And, and I promise you, it's not working. Uh, I mean, you, you got a lot of new talent out there. And I'm glad for them. And and, and all you new talent, I, and, and and I told you, always be prepared. Go to Russian schools that people can really teach you, not somebody that nobody knows. Because our business is being at the right place at the right time. And when you're at the right place at the right time, and knowing what to do, uh, that's what I look at. I know uh, I'm a ball, and I didn't bounce from here because you asked me this question. But the best way to answer that is not I'm saying, you know, when you have two big major companies like that, and unless you're somebody really special, and uh, and that, you know, I, I'm I'm curious to know, you know, when it when we do start back up, which I can't wait for the business to start back up, you know, be, be out and, and seeing the fans is watching how the attendance comes back, uh, watching see what they're doing. I I don't know. Because I haven't been keeping up what the ratings are doing with no people in the. They're not doing they, well. Uh, they're around zero point five for WWE. Oh, yeah, really? And they're in the okay. zero point twos oh. for AEW. You got to be kidding me! We'll see. They need to give them something. Uh, it, a little bit better. I, I was going. It, it, oh yeah! Now what I was going to say is is to all the boys and. WWE, NXT, and AEW. Do you really know how hard it is to perform in front of no crowd? It's, yeah, I don't know about anybody else, but for me, I uh, base myself off the crowd reactions. I told a story in my match off the crowd reaction. That's why I can't wait. You know, I'm on a pay per view this Saturday night, my son and I. And we're wrestling on a pay-per-view with no crowd uh, up in Charleston, West Virginia. So uh, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to it, but I know how hard it's going to be and how much harder you have to work. Uh, 
a lot of the fans and, and okay, here you go. I, I'll be an asshole. A lot of the marks, they really don't understand how how bump really feels. When you get your adrenaline going, you take that big bump. But when that adrenaline's not going, you take that big bump, it hurts like a oh, son of a bitch. You hear me? <laughs> it hurts. Yeah. You know, that, that extra potato from Idaho hurts like a son of a bitch. Uh, that's what you, <laughs> you know. You get where I'm coming from. If you've oh, been yeah. in the ring, if you hadn't been in the ring, you don't know. And uh, that's my answer to that, buddy. And for the Midnight Express, what was your favorite version of the Midnight Express? Oh, I love both of them. And now the reason, but you see, but you, you got to understand there was like five or six different versions. You know, it first started off as uh, Randy Rhodes and Nova Austin. I don't know if you know those guys. And it was yeah. uh, Randy Rhodes and Dennis Condry. Then it was Nova Austin and, and Dennis Condry. Randy, uh, but Bobby Eaton and Dennis, when they went together but see now i don't know what happened to dennis but we're in the middle of an angle buddy we're selling out everywhere and dennis Condry pulls a hoodie i mean he just disappears never asked him why when it was none of my business had to be something urgent but see when you have a great worker now stan lane was part of the the fabulous ones in Memphis. You remember that we played second yeah. fiddle too, but he was a hell of a worker. They were baby faces there, but Stan was a, he's a good looking guy, that body, that heel that, you know, that made, you know, he made the man jealous of shit of him. You know, he, he had that body. He had that look. And, and when your girlfriend's in the bar looking at you, hated it. But you see, it's hard, and I tell you again in a minute, uh, it's hard for somebody to come in and take their place. But Stan was that good of a worker that when they replaced Stan with Dennis, it was just that charisma that Stan had that they didn't miss a beat. And I see that uh, uh, again, cause, and, it, and it was Stan Lane the one that left this time when we were in Smoky Mountain it, him and Tom Pritchard were the heavenly bodies. Uh, and Stan left, and, and Jimmy brought this kid in in the dressing room, introduced me to him. He's a little redheaded kid with one tooth missing. And I'm looking at it, and I'm going, holy shit. And it, it, it was Jimmy Del Rey. And I'm going, God, man, what's he got? But when I got to the ring and locked up with him, but he was, <laughs> I knew he was money. He <laughs> He was that good. Jimmy Del Rey was. Uh, I mean, he was absolutely phenomenal. But he, you know, and being a small territory, and, and and him coming in and carried that load. God, it was great. Any favorite match of you against either version of the Midnight Express? Ah, uh, well, the uh, scaffold matches. They were great. You know, what I'm saying. Uh, you know what, man? I've, I've been wrestling for. 38 years and I, I figured up that you know I had I'm serious over 10,000 matches it's hard for me unless unless I'm watching the match to remember a match I had so many uh, a lot of times things just got crazy uh, I've told you I think I told you this earlier I've, you know I, my, I cut my TV on downstairs and it shows old clips that I don't even remember uh, of people that I've wrestled. And it's a lot of things going on. Hold on just for a second. You cut this yep. out, can't you? Yeah. You, what? Going to the lake. I thought you were going to the bank. Okay. Bye. All right. I'm back with you. I'm sorry. Hey, uh. You got a couple more questions to ask me. I'm going to have to take my boy. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. So a couple more questions. You were in WW, WCW in 96. Didn't last very long. What was the purpose of that? WCW, me? Uh, when you were in WCW in 1996, 
uh, it didn't last very long. Was did they sign you to a contract, or was that just for a few shots? No, just for a few shots. During the you night know what? Trip. And and this is what I was telling you earlier. Uh, yeah, I couldn't get a contract. I don't know why. A lot of times, the people were scared of me. And not because of that. It's just because when they bring you in, they, it, and I told you earlier, I, with a big company, I would like to have my job. Okay? You hired me for Ricky Morton's job. I don't want this guy's job. I don't want his job. I don't want him to be scared that I'm coming after his job. That's what's hard for me. Because I'm, I'm telling you guys, I, I, nobody has the answers to everything in this business. But I know how to put asses in seats. I know how to get ratings on TV. A lot of times I don't tell. Well, I mean, we're sitting here talking right now, and I gave you a few, but it's a lot of other things you can do, too. Uh, WWE needs to do it. AEW needs to do it. Uh, a lot of times personalities clash. Uh, if it hadn't yet, it's going to promise you that. Promise you that. You have to be ready for that. You got to have, uh, you know, in everything that you do, you got to have a, a plan B. Uh, you know, uh, when you're doing things and this guy don't like, you know, you, you, you got to have a plan B. And when you shoot an angle, it's like writing a book. You got to write the, the ending first. And when you do that right there, uh, it seems like to me they're just jumping from week to week doing things. Oh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. You know, oh, that didn't work, so we erase that. Do this. Uh, it's got like scrambled eggs. You, you don't have an answer to nothing. So at that point of me being there, I'm just looking to get paid every week. <laughs> that was all. That was all I was looking for. And the last guy I'll ask you about is Gino Hernandez. You briefly mentioned him earlier, but do you have anything else to say about him? Gino, in his prime, buddy, he was he was it. Uh, him and Tully Blanchard. Gino, you know, he had that body on him. He had that charisma about him that you hated him. <laughs> no, but he could talk. I mean, it, and and. And ninety percent of our business is talking, and God, he was a—he was just that great, great talker that you could, uh, you know, the people believed it and they hated him. I remember when he left San Antonio to go to uh, TBS. Uh, you know, he wouldn't wrestle on TV. If you want to watch me wrestle, you got to pay <laughs> and see him, and I, and I loved that. Do you know. Uh, uh, he and being in in San Antonio, he we were all young. We was learning again. You know, he was another talent that left the world way too early. But but sometimes you gotta. It's just the way it happens. I, I like Gino. He was, you know, I had my times with him. I tell you, you know, Tino Gino liked the, the gimmick. Uh, I was. Uh, First of all, I'm wrestling in Houston, Texas. And, you know, in, in our business, I'm not here to insult anybody's intelligence. I got a little color. And uh, it was his time. And it, and I'm watching him. If you people could see me, here we are. We're at Sam Houston Coliseum. There's 8,000 people. Uh, I, you know, I'm bleeding. I take the chain from him and I hit him. Well, when I hit him, he just stops. He pulls his arm up. Pulls it out. He looks at it like this. And he, he, oh, and I'm losing my mind. I run over and I hit him. I said, go up under the ring and do that. Well, boom, I hit him. He goes up out and he goes up under the ring. But there's no Gino. Well, boom, I went hell. So I jumped out of the ring. And I looked up the cover lock. I'm going up under there. Hell, he started a lot of cocaine up under the ring. Oh, I, I like to shit when I see that, man. I, uh, you want one? Well, hell no, man. We're in the fucking middle of a match, you dumbass. Uh, but that's a true story, really. Was that in his trucks, or did he like stored it under the ring earlier? Oh, I don't know. He had a vial. 
It was in a vial. You know, he's pulling it out, hitting it. And I'm going, what the hell, dude? Wow. You know what? I, I did a lot of shit, but I didn't, uh, you know, but I didn't do cocaine, <laughs> go to the ring. I mean, when I got through wrestling, it was my time. And I guess it's a really bad problem. You know, not a bad problem, but I just didn't give a shit. You hear what I'm saying? What the no. part that I did so much of it's just I if I had it, I'd done it from somebody. They they tell on you. Everybody tells on you. In the eighties, what percentage of wrestlers would you say did that stuff? It's on drugs? Yeah. Seems like a, a very high percentage. Oh, uh, not oh yes. You know, the ones that you that you thought that was doing it wasn't doing it, you know. And, and I, I say this, uh you know, he's your world champion, Ric Flair. He goes, uh, you know, Rick was drug free. You know that, don't you? Now, he drank like a fucking fish, but he did no drugs. A lot of the guys did drugs. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Everyone I knew did beside Flair. <laughs> you know, uh, I, uh, you know, it was, it was hard. You know, like you, I told you earlier, man, you, <clears throat> one night you were in Miami. <clears throat> Next night you were in. Portland, Oregon, you know, the time zone, the dad, you know, and you just, you had, to, you had to have some help to get through what we did and everything. Uh, you know what, but I, I'm not trying to cut your interview short here. I've got to. Uh, yeah. Do you want to just let people know about your wrestling school? The oh yeah. I want to let people know everything about me. You know, uh, I'm on Facebook under Ricky Morton, uh, Facebook school of Morton. Instagram, real Ricky Morton. Uh, uh, no, Twitter, real Ricky Morton. Instagram, Ricky Morton. For hell, I don't know. I got so many I don't know. Just look. Hey, I'll tell you what you do. Just punch in Ricky Morton and you get it. Okay. Uh, but my uh, saying earlier, my wrestling school, I come on every Sunday, 5 uh, 05. That's Eastern time. It's on YouTube under School of Morton. Uh, and I just want to say I can't wait to get back to work and to, to see a lot of people. Uh, you know, when you do something, you know, all together, I've been, I've been in the business for 46 years. You know, I wrestle on my own. And, I've been with, and, and when you do something for so long and this virus happens and all of a sudden, boom, there's nothing. It, it, you know, it really trips you out I, I i know that you that you're looking at me and, it, and a lot of you young guys are well i need to retire you need to quit but this is the only way i know how to make a living i'm not out there trying to get anybody's job i'm just trying to pay my bills uh i uh it, it's like this right here if you want to impress me eat an apple and shit a fruit salad that would impress me other than that i've seen it all Rison's my life always has been and when you see me on the show it's not that i'm going to be there to be somebody i'm not i'm there just to pay bills love you buddy have a good day thank you thank you for watching the hannibal tv please like this video if you enjoyed it and click the subscribe button to not miss any of our latest shoot interviews match videos or news updates support us on patreon.com for $1.99 a month to watch our full shoot interviews ad free and help our channel grow follow us on twitter at the hannibal tv for instant updates